Good evening, members and members of the public. Um, I'm Councillor Paul Cooper, and I am the Chairman of Strategic Planning and Infrastructure Committee, and I am delighted to welcome you all this evening to uh, this meeting. Uh, just for information, the meeting will be broadcast live and it will be recorded for playback on the Council's YouTube channel. Um, just for information, will anybody else um, be recording proceedings this evening? I ask not to prevent you, but just to make sure that everyone is aware. I take that as a no. Um, members present on the Skype call, um, please uh, mute your microphones when you're not speaking. And I remind you now that instant messaging will be visible um, on the webcast, so it should only be used to indicate your wish to speak and not for any um, comments. Um, members in the chamber, the same goes for you. Please mute your microphones when you're not speaking. Um, because I'm sure sometimes there are things you might not want everyone to hear. Um, we're not expecting a fire drill this evening, but obviously if the fire alarm does sound, um, please um, look to Olivia for guidance. Um, and if she runs, follow her. Um, so we move on to item number one, which is apologies. We have received apologies this evening from Councillor Mrs. Grigg, um, and which leads us quite nicely onto item two, which is substitute members. I understand <laughs> Councillor English. <laughs> for the last time conceivably possible, I'm substituting for Sue Grigg. <laughs> thank you very much. It's, uh, yes, indeed, it will be the last time it is possible. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, there are no other substitutes. Item number three is urgent items. There is an urgent update to item 21, which is the Maidstone Authority Monitoring Report. It contains additional information um, to that which is going to be presented in the report. This was circulated to the committee and was made available online last week. Um, and also, whilst not an urgent item, two nominations have been received for, uh, sorry, one nomination has been received for item 14, which is appointment to the Kent Downs line, and two nominations have been made for agenda um, item 15, which is appointment to the Maidstone Cycle Campaign Forum. Um, Visiting members, item number four. Um, there are no visiting members in attendance, neither um, physically nor virtually. Item five, disclosures by officers and members. Um, are there any disclosures by officers and members this evening? I take that as a no. Um, so apologies, Council English. Um, I am a member of the parent body of the Medway Valley Line Partnership and the Kent Downs Line Partnership. I don't believe that uh, prohibits me from uh, supporting a nomination of one way or the other, but uh, I just thought people should be aware of that. Thank you very much, Councillor English. I appreciate you um, informing us. Um, then item number six, uh, if there are no other um, Disclosures. Um, item number six is disclosures of lobbying. Have any members been lobbied to any items on the agenda? Councillor Mrs. Springett. Just because, in case it's mentioned, anything to do with the local plan. Can I take it that all members have been lobbied in relation to the local plan review update and, and anything related to the local plan? Has anyone been lobbied on any other item on the agenda? Councillor English. I uh, was very broadly lobbied by some residents in the town centre on parking charges. Fine. Thank you very much for disclosing that. Um, any more? Ah, Councillor Mrs Rose, apologies. Uh, yes, I just see that Fant is mentioned when we're talking about um, uh, HMOs. So, okay. Thank you very much. Um, nobody else is indicating, therefore I move on. Item number seven is to consider whether any items should be taken in private because of the disclosure of exempt information. And I do propose that item 24, park and ride, be taken in closed session due to the possible disclosure of exempt information, having applied the public interest test. Is this agreed, members? Agreed? No dissension? Thank you very much, that is agreed. Um, just on that, um, Two of the officers will not be available if we do have to adjourn this meeting to um, the reserve date on Thursday. I'm very hopeful that we do not need to adjourn this meeting until 
Thursday. However, if it looks likely that we are struggling to get through the agenda, I will adjust the order of proceedings to ensure that um, the officer's expertise can be heard on this item. But um, I, I don't want to do that otherwise because it would exclude members of the public um, prematurely. Um, item number eight is minutes of the meeting held on the 9th of November 2021, which was there then adjoin, adjourned sorry, to the 19th of November 2021. That's pages one to seven of your agenda pack. Um, does anyone have any comments on the accuracy of the minutes? take that as a no. Therefore, I move that the minutes of the meeting held on the 9th of November and, and adjourned to the 19th of November be agreed as a correct record and signed. Is that agreed, members? Thank you. Item 9, um, there are no petitions this evening, um, which moves us swiftly on to item 10, nearly through the agenda. Um, item 10, question and answer session for members of the public. Uh, there are three questions from members of the public this evening. Um, I will take them in the order that they were they arrived. Therefore, I call Councillor Peter Cooling to ask his question, please. Uh, thank you very much. It is possible that the government will amend its formula for calculating assessed housing need. One possibility is that instead of using 2014 based housing projections, 2018 based would be mandated and that would reduce our figure by some 2,500 homes. How would you ensure that Reg 19 could be amended to remove sufficient sites to compensate for any reduction in assessed housing need as a result of government rethink. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Um, at the present time, there is absolutely nothing for us to work on. There is no policy in place. There, are merely, uh, there is merely press speculation of policies. Um, therefore, it, it would be inappropriate for us to make any changes at this point. Nevertheless, the, this authority, um, both politically and officers within, will keep abreast of any changes. And at such a time that there are changes made, we will uh, apply the appropriate a resource to uh, making any amendments. Do you have a supplementary question arising from that? If I may, uh, do you not think, given the uncertainty, do you not think that officers should be making, con should be contingency thinking for the various possibilities that might arise from GOES rethink rather than the borough just ploughing ahead without any modification to Reg 19 to enable sub 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 subsequent uh, amendments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, absolutely not. No, I think it would be a waste of taxpayers' money and resource at the moment until there is such a time that we are aware of any changes. Currently, there are infinite possibilities of what changes may be, and there may indeed be no changes. If there are changes um, to that number, I personally, and I'm sure this committee, um, will hold our officers to account and ensure that uh, changes are made at that time, but at the moment I think it would be rather foolhardy for us to press forward, assuming that changes will be made that in every possibility will not be. Thank you very much. Um, I now call um, Mr Duncan Edward Edwards, who is, vis uh, who is with us virtually, to ask his question, please. Good evening. Um, Duncan Edwards from the Maidstone Cycle Campaign Forum. In the last 10 years, Maidstone's transport challenges have changed dramatically with the need to support 17,600 new dwellings and deliver sustainable transport solutions. And yet the Regulation 19 Local Plan Review, Maidstone has republished its 10-year-old Integrated Transport Strategy and called it the Integrated Transport Strategy September 2021. With transport and sustainability being an increasingly hot issue, is there a plan to fully update this document and the support documents included in the local uh, cycling and walking infrastructure plan as a matter of urgency? 
Uh, Mr. Edwards, thank you very much for your question. Um, there are two relevant documents, in fact. There's the original integrated transport strategy, um, which has to remain as it reflects the fact that delivery of the existing local plan 2017 will continue for several years to come. Um, whilst referring to the same plan period as the local plan 2017, i.e. 2011 to 2031, it was in fact adopted in um, September 2016. In addition to this, there is a separate integrated transport strategy 2021 addendum document, and this sets out the additional measures associated with the local plan review. Keeping the documents separate helps disaggregate between the two strategies and assists with the monitoring of progress and delivery. Implicitly, therefore, the delivery of the integrated transport strategy addendum will also help take place over several will also take place over several years, particularly given the spatial approach contained within the local plan review. Accordingly, both integrated transport strategies will need to be delivered concurrently. Um, do you have a supplementary question arising out of your original question or the reply? Um, yes, to do it for me. Um, so the addendum is um, not really um, fulsome in its coverage as it uh, focuses primarily on the um, garden villages. Um, and it doesn't seem to do justice to um, the amount of update that is required over that period of time. It, it, is it therefore not necessary to put some work in to um, at least provide an update um, for uh, 2021 to cover those urgent points? Um, thank you very much. I, I think, uh, if I can answer your question in sort of two points, I think first and foremost the main thrust of the local plan review is, is is very much focused upon garden communities so that is precisely why there is a huge emphasis on on the transport strategy within those garden communities um, but it does give a lot of added weight um, to the, the existing um, tra integrated transport strategy in particularly in relation to to our um, dispersed approach which is, is taking part of that so I, I, I think it would be unfair to say that it, it doesn't deliver um, on both prongs um, I hope that has answered your question but, but nevertheless I would be more than happy to, to follow that up with you um, Duncan at a later date thank you um, for your question um, thank you very much finally I, uh, our third question this evening I call councillor Peter Titchener to ask his question the floor is yours Good evening, Chairman, members. Uh, Maidstone has a very disproportionate share of traveller caravans in Kent. As the need for traveller pitches in the Maidstone Local Plan 2017 appears to have been based on the historical link with agriculture, which is no longer true, that's policy TM15, have the consultants preparing their report to underpin the Gypsy Traveller and Show People Development Planning document, been told to revise their assumptions of need accordingly with consultation input from the settled community? Well, the short answer is, is yes, um, but if I can give you a little bit more detail on that. So policy DM15, which you refer to the local plan, it assists in the assessment of planning application proposals for Gypsy Traveller and Travelling Show People Accommodation and is intended to be carried forward to the local plan review. It doesn't seek to modify its approach based on historical links with agriculture or otherwise, but it does provide a robust, a robust platform from which to assess individual um, proposals. There is no evidence to um, adjust that calculation. The future approach to meeting uh, Gypsy Traveller and Travelling Show People accommodation needs will be contained in the forthcoming Gypsy and Traveller Development Plan document, um, which we've been having a lot of conversations about and, and will be brought to this committee um, either next month or, or February um, in its early stages. And this is going to be informed by an ongoing Gypsy Traveller and Travelling Show People accommodation needs assessment. This assessment considers the needs in an objective manner as required by government guidance that applies nationally. This will be subject to scrutiny at appeals and at key stages of production of the development plan document, including independent examination um, by an inspector appointed by the Secretary of State. The DPD will be subject to public consultations in order that all inter interested parties, and I'm sure yourself and your parish, will be able to input into the process. 
Um, do you have a supplementary question arising out of your original? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I, I would, if I may. Um, thank you for that. Um, I just want to sort of say that as Maidstone has over 30% of all traveller caravans in Kent, will MBC be more rigorous in future in defining need as per its final appeal statement for the traveller application 16 stroke 5034030 paragraph 4.2, which says, and this is what MBC say, that personal circumstances do not outweigh the harm and conflict with policy. Now I say that because in the past we've always been told that personal circumstances appear to, do appear to outweigh policy. I'd just like to know if this is going to be looked at more rigorously. Um, well, yes, this will be looked at as part of the um, DPD document, um, uh, but I, I, I fear that I might not be able to give you the reassurance you, um, you're seeking this evening. Um, we, we, there is an awful lot of national policy on this, and, and, and to an extent we are, to a huge extent, we're beholden to that. Um, but we are constantly challenging the referring to your original question, um, we're constantly challenging the, the methodology for calculating um, the need, but as you refer, there is a, there is a huge amount of, of perceived need in Maidstone, um, and I, unfortunately f for your situation, we, we can't change that, but we're going to look at it and, and develop a solution in, in the best way that we possibly can. Um, I hope that that has answered your question and given you a little bit of reassurance, um, but it is, it is obviously a very difficult topic for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, members and members of the public. That now concludes the question and answer session from members of the public. So we move on to item number, uh, sorry, item number 11, which is questions and answers from uh, members of the council to the chairman. There are no questions from members this evening. Um, therefore, item number 12, um, which is a committee work program, which is pages eight to nine of your agenda pack. Um, now, do any officers or members of the committee have any comments on the work programme? Council English. Um, we've been waiting in terms of the 20 mile an hour speed limit for the summary of conclusions from KCC for a very long time. Uh, it's the only chance of actually getting it. Um, we've been waiting for a lot from KCC for a very long time. Um, I will chase that up for you um, and, and hopefully I will be able to bring something or at least a response to the next committee meeting. And this is a very minor point but on the 20 mile an hour scheme for Hale Road it's misspelled, it's got a Y in Hale Road, it's H-A-Y-L-E. I'm sorry, I, I obviously had I written the document it would have been perfect but um, I have a... It's, <laughs> it's, uh, yes, I, I, but uh, no, I... I um, Thank you very much. Noted. Councillor Mumford. <coughs> you gave me the assurance that the conservation area funding opportunities won't be kicked into the long grass, your words. Um, I'm still waiting for a date to bring that forward. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm not intentionally putting anything into the long grass. As I'm sure you're aware, there is an awfully long agenda this evening. There's a heck of a lot we need to get through for January. Um, very controversially, I've, I've even suggested we might need an extra committee meeting at some point to start clearing some of the items on this um, work program. Um, it, it, it is very difficult at the moment trying to um, move the most important matters forward. Um, so inevitably, that does mean kicking some things into the long grass. But um, Councillor Springer and I um, are trying to bring as much forward as we possibly can, which is why tonight is, is particularly heavy. I think January will be the same. If, if I can get the um, approval of members of the committee and the proper officer to, pull, uh, to uh, have an extra meeting, if necessary, I think that might be helpful um, for bringing forward the precise um, item that you've suggested. So I am sorry for that. But um, any other um, comments on the work program members? No, thank you very much. Um, I therefore move that the work program be noted. Is that agreed? Is it noted? Thank you. Um, 
Item number 13 is reports of outside bodies. There are none this evening. So we move on to item number 14, which is appointment to the Kent Downs line. Um, Olivia, over to you, please. Thank you, Chairman, and good evening, members. Uh, there are two positions associated with the Kent Downs line, and these were advertised to all councillors. And one nomination has been received from Councillor Garton, and this has been provided to you this evening. There is no specific term of office for the position. The committee is, of course, able and invited to consider any other nominations from any members present this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Olivia. Um, there are no visiting members to speak on this item. So, um, does anyone wish to speak on this item? Councillor English. I just wondered whether Dennis Spooner would be interested, or Val would be interested in putting their names forward because the Kent Downs line does go through Beersted and uh, I know Dennis has been to uh, our uh, inspection tour of railway stations recently so has shown some interest. Councillor um, Spooner. Thank you, uh, Councillor English. Um, I have read this and I have been a member of of Borough Council member of the Kent Downs Community Line Round Partnership now for two or three years. Um, I wasn't aware that there were any vacancies or adverts for um, people to um, be replaced. So I had assumed that I would be carrying on. That was my understanding. If I've got that wrong, um, perhaps someone could explain to me. Therefore, can I take that as a proposal, Councillor English? And I'm looking to you, Councillor Spring, it's a second. Quite happy to second, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, does anybody else wish to comment on this before we uh, move forward? Fine, therefore, um, we have uh, a nomination received from Councillor Garton. Um, does that need to be proposed and seconded? If so, I'm happy to propose. Yeah, fine. So, um, are we happy to agree both of those uh, Councillor Garton and Councillor Spooner um, together, members. Is that agreed? Agreed. I don't think there's any dissension. Thank you very much. Um, therefore, Councillor Spooner and Councillor Garton are, are appointed. And there you were thinking you were going to enjoy retirement. Um, item number 15 is appointment to the Maidstone Cycle Campaign Forum. Again, Olivia, please introduce the item. Uh, thank you, Chairman. So there is one position available for the Maystone Cycle Campaign Forum, and this was also advertised um, alongside, the, alongside the Kent Downs Line position. Um, the term of office is for four years. Um, I am aware that there has been some um, interest expressed from Councillor Margaret Rose, um, but of course the committee is able to consider any further interests expressed. Thank you. Um, in addition to the interest expressed from uh, Councillor Margaret Rose, I've also received interest from Councillor Lottie Parfit reed um, which obviously makes it uh, what is generally a non-controversial item slightly awkward. Um, do any members have anything they wish to, to add? Uh, any comments from any members? Can just, I'll take Councillor English then Councillor Spring. Just for information, I'm already a member of it, so, so that's... Oh, for information. Thank you very much. That's fine. Councillor Springett. Um, I seem to recall that um, Councillor Parfit reed has been doing quite a bit of cycling, I believe, with uh, Duncan Edwards. So I think she went out looking at cycle routes. So um, I would say she's quite a good candidate, just on that thought from what I've heard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I take that as a proposal? Yes. If, if if she Thank has put her name forward, I would accept that. I, I would propose her yes, because I know she has been getting involved in cycling. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Garson. Uh, I'm happy to second it. Um, I believe we already have some Labour councillors on that forum, so therefore, for political balance, I would uh, second it. Thank you for seconding. I, I'm, I'm not, uh, for the record, I'm not too worried about political balance on the cycle campaign forum. Um, it's, it's, uh, um, uh, you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, usually I am, I am very um, uh, acutely aware of, of political balance. Um, now, Councillor Parfit Reid has been nominated and seconded. Um, uh, Councillor Rose, would you like to speak? Uh, in the interest of political balance, 
I am prepared to concede uh, my application. Thank you. Thank you very much. That makes matters much easier. Is that agreed? That can <laughs> there will be no tongue poking in my committee. Um, is that agreed, members? Uh, okay. Thank you very much. That makes life a lot easier. Um, Councillor, uh, item number 16. Um, now I'm looking at you, Councillor Rose, um, for item number 16, but this will be introduced by uh, Olivia again. Uh, thank you, Chairman. So, there have been no nominations, no nomination forms received or interest expressed for the vacant position on the Medway Valley Line Steering Group, and there is no specific term of office for the position. At its meeting on the 6th of July 2021, this committee resolved to re-advertise this position after considering the outside body's vacancy protocol. If there are no nominations for this position, the committee could consider whether they would like to make a recommendation to Council to reduce the number of positions on the body from two to one, as one has already been filled. Um, otherwise, the position will be re-advertised at a later date. Thank you very much. This line does run straight through the middle of Fant Ward. Councillor English, you've indicated... Yes, I was just going to say, we, um, it does indeed. Maidstone West Station is a large feature of Fant Ward, very important one, and I would like to say that... Um, we have had very valuable contributions from the Fant Ward councillor who has been involved already and some other councillors along the route. Um, and if, Ma if Councillor Margaret Rose was willing to stand, I would definitely be willing to nominate her. Please don't feel forced to, but uh, <laughs> nonetheless, <laughs> Councillor Rose. I thank your confidence in me, Councillor English, and I will be happy to accept. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in which Councillor case? Garton. I'll be happy to uh, second that proposal. <laughs> Is that for the sake of political balance? Uh, were, you going to, were you going to second as well, Councillor Springett? Yes. Right. Fine. If nobody else has indicated, therefore, um, is that agreed, members? Agreed unanimously. Thank you very much. Um, now we move on to item number 17, which is the second quarter financial update and performance monitoring report, which is on pages 10 to 31 of your agenda packs. And this report will be introduced by Mark Green and Carly Benville. Over to you, please. Thank you, Chair, <clears throat> and good evening, members. Uh, I'll start by introducing uh, the first two items that form part of this report, and then I'll hand over to Carly. And the first appendix deals with the financial position for the first two quarters. And I'm pleased to say that the position for this committee uh, is positive. Uh, for the uh, year as a whole, we're now projecting a favourable variance from budget of 360,000, albeit that the budget uh, for parking was reduced in the light of uh, expected lower than, uh, than uh, uh, previously uh, experienced performance. Um, the uh, local plan, which is dealt with separately from the rest of the revenue budget, is also reported on here, um, and that is over the originally budgeted level of spend, uh, but uh, as was reported to this committee uh, earlier this year, uh, that uh, can be covered uh, through corporate contingency, uh, so far as the remainder of this year is concerned, and we'll look afresh at how the local plan is funded for future years as part of the budget process. Uh, the other thing I'd like to draw your attention to is uh, an appendix uh, on page 28, uh, which, in response to a request from the, the chairman, sets out details uh, of pay and display parking revenue, car park by car park. Uh, the, uh, the usual monitoring report just gives a headline figure for pay and display. This shows. <coughs> how individual car parks are performing. Uh, and uh, we've got Jeff Kitson, Parking Services Manager, here this evening. So if members have any questions on the detail, I suggest you, uh, you address those uh, questions to him. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. So uh, if I hand over to Carly now to, uh, to introduce uh, Appendix 3 of the Quarter 2 Monitoring Report. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, and good evening, Chairman and Members. So the Quarter 2 Performance Report is found on pages 29 to 31 of your agenda packs this evening. And as you can see from the report, two of the six indicators for this committee missed their targets. However, they were both missed within 10%. 
Now, the percentage of priority two planning enforcement cases dealt with in time achieved an outturn of 87.42% against a target of 90%, which is an improvement from quarter one by over 10 percentage points. And whilst vacant posts in the team have now been filled, the team have since suffered from long-term staff sickness in quarter two. However, the introduction of a temporary senior officer is helping to reduce the backlog that's built up over the last 12 months. Now, the second indicator to miss its target is the KPI monitoring the processing of major planning applications, which achieved an outcome of 88.89% against the target of 90%. And the, the team in the quarter have switched resources to assist with the local plan team, helping them write the housing allocations policy within the local plan review. So they do expect this performance to improve in quarter three. Good, good performance was seen in the remainder of the KPIs reported to this committee, including the percentage of priority one enforcement cases dealt with in time, which achieved 100%, and also in the number of affordable homes delivered in the quarter, which over doubled the target set. And now alongside Mark, I am happy to take any questions on the report. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carly and, and Mark. Um, there are no visiting members this evening. Um, for um, members, um, does anyone have any questions relating to this? Councillor Garton, please. Question, please, Mr Chairman. <clears throat> when we read on page 22, column, uh, column G for golf, if it's a negative figure, that means we are actually making a profit. Is that correct? Uh, yes. I, yes. It, oh, it's the other way around. I'm so, ignore me, um, Mark. A, sorry. A, a negative is an adverse variance. So overall, you can see we've got a favourable variance for uh, for planning of two hundred forty-five thousand. So if we're looking at development control advice and uh, development control majors, this is not good news for us. Sorry. Chair. Sorry. Mr. Jarman. Yeah. It, in plain English, it's, it's not profit and loss. It's against estimate. Right, I, I don't want to dwell on that uh, much more. May I, may I just draw members' um, attention to those figures because I want to come back to uh, development control and development control majors at the next agenda item. Thank you very much, Councillor Gard. We look forward to it. Um, any other members um, wish to ask any questions? Fine. Thank you very much. Um, this report is for noting. Therefore, is this report noted, members? Thank you very much. Um, item number 18, which is fees and charges 2022-2023, pages 32 to 78 of your agenda pack, um, will be presented by Mark Green, please. Thank you. We bring this report to the committee every year following a review of fees and charges in the uh, areas covered by this committee. Um, for this year, there are relatively few changes. Uh, in previous years, uh, we've, we've often increased parking fees, uh, but this year, we've not increased parking fees other than a, a few housekeeping adjustments, given that we're still recovering from COVID. So what you have uh, here uh, and are set out in the appendix uh, is uh, some housekeeping changes, some modest inflationary uh, increases, uh, particularly in building control, um, and you can see the overall impact of those uh, on the budget in the table at the top of page 37, uh, and you're asked to, uh, to agree the uh, discretionary fee increases, the statutory fee increases, we have no control over. Um, so uh, I'm happy to take any questions. And on the individual service areas, uh, you've got Jeff Kitson here to talk about parking, and I think Rob um, would be able to deal with any questions on 
um, on the planning fees. Thank you. Councillor Gart, and I'll come to you first. You've already indicated that you wish to ask a question, and I will come to Councillor English. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, yes, if we're looking at page 53, Householder Proposals Pre-Application Fees, and compare that figure with uh, advice for major development proposals, 10 to 39 dwellings. Now, an individual householder has to pay 70 pound here while per house, per application, while a major developer would only pay eight pound 97. I think there's a great discrepancy as far as our charging policy is concerned, which we will be discussing later at page 22 of the charging policy. Um, sorry, uh, uh, paragraph 8.1 of the charging policy, where, where it says we should encourage or facilitate access to the service. So I think for a small developer, one or two houses, the fees should be proportionately less than for a larger developer. So I don't want to dwell on this tonight or um, uh, uh, try to reinvent the wheel on, uh, in, in a hurry, but if we could have a report to this committee to look at um, this sort of uh, situation and that we could maybe uh, charge larger de major developers more money in future and um, less money or equal money to smaller developers. Um, if, if we could have a report and address, bring that back to the committee in future. Uh, thank you, Councillor Garden. I will um, see if we can um, add that to the work programme. Uh, uh, Mr Jarman, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, um, an important point about any discretionary fees is that we have to cover our costs. It's not a cash cow. Um, so we have to substantiate um, how much we charge for everything. Um, the, the, the lower the fee, the higher the administrative charge. So for a householder, most of that fee is administration. So everything in addition to that has to be justified. Thank you, Mr. John. Can I just confirm? Are, are you happy that the charges are justified as they as they stand? Uh, very much so, because um, I think it was the business year before last we um, put them up by a considerable amount, and we looked obviously in a lot of detail into justifying these fees. Thank you, William. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. And just to add to uh, what Rob's saying there is we did do a full review, didn't we, an hour by hour analysis and uh, and so on and cost build up. So I would suggest, you know, this this that work is still fresh and relevant and perhaps we don't need to do the full review at this committee again. Thank you. Are you happy with that response, Councillor Garden? Well, obviously not, um, because it contradicts what, what I suggested. Um, well, we've seen the variances on, on this one, uh, so the income is not as uh, we uh, expect it to be. We don't seem to be covering our costs here. Um, and it is a great unfairness in the system that um, small uh, applicants, small-scale applicants, pay substantially more um, for I, I do understand the, the officer's time is the same and the cost to the officers is the same, but it is the accessibility to the service for the taxpayer which I am concerned about. Okay, I, I, I note your concern. Um, I, I mean, I can, I can perhaps ask that the, the head of planning comes back to you offline about this, but I, I suspect that there's a statutory reason that we can't use this as a cash cow for the council. Am I, am I correct in that regard? Uh, yes, and I'd, I'd emphasize that these are not losses. This is against estimate. So there's an, you know, everything has price elasticity. So there's an argument to say that if the fees go up again, significantly, then obviously the estimate will go up. So the variance, the negative variance, will logically get greater. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Gardner, for your question. I'll, um, I, I will ask uh, Rob Jarman to, to contact you 
um, separately about this. Councillor English, please. Yeah, just on that point, and I'll go on to my main point. They, the system doesn't really allow for, for what Councillor Garton is asking for, which is essentially cross-subsidy. Um, that's not no more allowed in the planning fee system than it is when you're running a bus service, unfortunately. And, uh, for, for, and um, it would be quite difficult to actually do. Um, as, as William will remember, the debates in previous years predicting the level of, of planning applications one is going to get, whether minor, major or household or whatever, it is, is not an, ever going to be an exact science. Um, some, some years we underestimate it, some years we overestimate it. Um, you know, we didn't expect a pandemic, um, so to give one example. So, uh, you know, these things are inherently unpredictable. Um, turning to something which is almost as unpredictable, and that's parking. Um, but ask Mr. Kitson, um, you recall we had discussions in the past, Jess, about um, those people in the town centre who um, often through actions of this council or often justified actions of this council don't have actually any car parking, um, which um, is often the right thing to do, I suppose. But if you look, um, if you look at the only way of addressing that, which is the uh, 12 monthly season ticket for nighttime car parking in, in car parks, mostly in the town centre, but it could be anywhere. Is there any scope at all for, for helping people with that situation? Uh, Jeff Kitson, over to you. Uh, good evening. The, um, the issue there really is that um, this is quite a new permit. Um, and it's fair to say that although it's been available for the last year, we've had very, very few applications for it, despite it being published on the web pages. Um, previous to that, um, more often than not, the residence permit scheme did cover um, those applications quite well. Um, these are more specifically designed for those people that are living um, within the town centre itself, um, in other words, beyond the residence parking scheme, because as you know, the residence parking scheme is slightly outside the town centre. Um, and so, you know, the thought was is that this residence permit, uh, or should I say this season ticket, off peak season ticket, should really accommodate those people that are living within the town centre. Uh, and we will, of course, start to promote that even more. But, but generally, most people in the residential areas just on the outskirts um, do use the residence parking scheme or areas where there are no restrictions after 6.30. Okay, so what I think you're saying there, Jeff, is that the issue is essentially about the fact that I suspect that a lot of the people in the town centre are not um, have not picked up on the availability of it, hence the lack of applications. So, so if, I, I think that my best thing to do is to pursue publicising this with your department directly. Oh, and I'll be getting me in touch about that. Yeah, absolutely. We will. Uh, we could work uh, with you on that and uh, present that and publicise that even more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I've got Councillor Springett, then Councillor Clark, please. Thank you. I mean, just on that point, I hadn't picked up on that. I'm just looking at that evening um, pass. Um, it's three hundred and fifty-seven pounds. So what have we got, 365 days in a year? Isn't it a pound a night for normal car park users? So it's not much of a discount for a season ticket. Just throwing that one in the pot. <laughs> that wasn't my question. My question was just above that on page 42, in the same area, the percentage change on almost all the car parks and parking charges is 0%, apart from um, there's a very high 20% on the 12 months seven days Monday to Sunday. I just wondered if, if we could have an explanation of why that's gone up by 20% and the one above it by 15%. So that seems quite a big percentage increase if we could just have an explanation. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Kitson, over to you. 
Uh, thank you. The um, season tickets, unfortunately, were um, their price was held for some years, um, and what has happened is that the tariff has been steadily increasing um, more often than not each year, um, it, albeit there were some years where, as this year, the, the charges were static. And so what happened is there was a disparity between the season ticket pricing um, and the regular pricing. Obviously, they're still offering a discount, but that discount was, was, was huge. So what we're doing is we're starting to increase the season tickets to just reduce that disparity to get them back to a more reasonable level. Thank you very much for that explanation, Jeff. Uh, Councillor Clark, next, please. Thank you. Um, I was actually going to raise exactly the same point, but I just wondered, it, um, before raising those, um, those prices, um, did you have any sort of consultation and did you get some feedback and, 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 um, and what, how did what did you receive if you did if you did go into consultation on that back to you jeff please each time we change the um pricing we need to also change the traffic regulation orders um part of that includes public consultation um, and so when we introduced the charge, I think it was last year, um, the traffic regulation order uh, process meant that we did have public consultation and we had no, um, no objections uh, recorded at that time. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Margaret Rose is the last person who's indicated. Uh, yes. Um, I'd just like to point out that we have had complaints from residents saying that more permits are issued than actual places to park. And there's a suggestion that, um, that, that as I say, there's, there's more permits. So um, I just wondered what your thoughts and comments are on that when, when people, people are saying that and uh, paying for permits and not being able to park. Um, I'll let Jeff answer that, but I, I guess the alternative is that people won't be able to get permits, um, which would then inevitably lead to those who, who um, have vehicles but no permit being un totally unable to park in the event that there is a space. But, um, Jeff, do you have any more on that? Um, only that the price, uh, the charge that supplied to residents permits um, really is the administration charge for producing the permit and enforcing that permit. It really isn't um, that residents are paying for a place to park as such. Um, of course, uh, as you know, we can't guarantee that. Um, in terms of do we issue more permits than spaces, absolutely we do. Um, that's normal practice. Um, and the reason why that's normal practice is it's extremely unlikely that everybody who has a residence permit would want to use it at the same time. Um, bearing in mind that the permits are generally during the peak times during the day. So, so yes, we do. Um, but more often than not, what we find is even in those areas where, where there is such a high demand for parking, people still apply for a permit on the basis that um, it could still offer them a place to park as and when uh, a space becomes available. Thank you very much for that. Right, um, members, no one else has indicated to speak. Uh, this report, there is um, one decision to be made, which is that the proposed discretionary fees and charges set out in Appendix 1 to this report are agreed. Is that agreed, members? Agreed, unanimous, thank you. And uh, is the report also noted? Noted, thank you very much. Uh, which moves us uh, swiftly on to item number 19, medium term financial strategy 2022 to 23, 26, 27, uh, which will be re uh, presented by Mark Green. Over to you, please. Thank you, Chair. This is the report that we bring at uh, this time of year, every year, to set the scene for the budget setting process. Uh, there will be detailed budget proposals coming to the committee in January, but this gives you the background. Uh, which is that the, uh, the overall strategic plan of the Council remains the same, uh, but there are uh, some emerging priorities, uh, including the uh, commitment to 1,000 affordable homes, development of a town centre strategy. So the, uh, the updated medium-term financial strategy will reflect those changing priorities. Uh, the assumptions that we'll be working with uh, in developing budgets uh, are, first of all, uh, that council tax will go up by 
uh, 2%, which is the referendum limit that the government is, uh, is due to set for next year. We have to make assumptions about inflation. The, um, the underlying assumption is that uh, inflation is 2%, uh, which is the government's and the Bank of England's long-term target. Uh, but I do recognise that inflation is currently running at a much higher level than that. So uh, you'll see in the strategic revenue projections that we've built in a, a 500,000 provision for next year to deal with the fact that the, uh, there is this one-off, we hope, uh, uh, hike in inflation um, uh, to put a higher core inflation assumption in would, I think, kind of be... Um, accepting that we're going to face inflation at 4 or 5% uh, for the foreseeable future, which I'm sure none of us would, would want to see. Within the overall assumptions about inflation, we do uh, also uh, take account of the fact that different types of cost go up at different rates. So we do have a higher inflation assumption, for example, for, for energy prices. The overall result of, of those various assumptions is that we're projecting, before building any new budget proposals, a surplus for next year, 22-23, uh, but a deficit for the year afterwards, because that year we have a number of things likely to hit us, uh, including the costs of a new waste collection contract uh, and the risk that we will lose business rates growth. We get a share of the business rates that we collect. Uh, so, although the position for next year looks reasonably favourable, we can't assume that that is going to be the case uh, for the remainder of the, the five-year planning period. Um, just a couple of other things to, to point out. Uh, I've mentioned, I mentioned uh, in the earlier item that we're looking at how we fund things like the local plan, and uh, it's recognised that in the new homes bonus, which is a, a grant that we, a revenue grant that we get from the government, uh, currently worth four million pounds, we do have an alternative source of funding uh, for things that are linked to um, uh, new homes. Uh, so it's flagged up uh, on page 111 of the agenda in the medium term financial strategy that we'll be looking at uh, how we can use the new homes bonus to uh, to fund uh, some of the things like. Uh, the local plan, uh, so uh, just something that we're, we're going to be exploring in more detail when we put re detailed budget proposals together. And the only other thing to flag up is um, Appendix C of the report is a, a survey of residents, which we always carry out this time of year, which um, tells you what residents think are the priorities for spending. Um, and so uh, you'll see that uh, parks and open spaces, housing and homelessness, environmental enforcement are the kind of things that the that residents would like us to see uh, to spend more money on. So just something to bear in mind uh, when we come to look at detailed budget proposals. Uh, so I'll leave it at that, but I'm happy to take any questions on the, the detail uh, in the report. Thank you. Councillor Garton, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm sure that Mark Green will know exactly what I'm saying now, which I said that policy and resources just two weeks ago, only days after we had the talk by a member of the Bank of England, the adverse forecast of 3% for inflation is, in my view, not high enough. We, we need to um, look at adverse conditions and as we are already at 2% of inflation and at 6.8 on page 105, it is already predicted that we are peaking at around 5% in April. Whether we peak and stay there or whether we peak and drop rather rapidly uh, remains to be seen. So I, I would like to see any future um, uh, uh, forecast to uh, up the adverse figure, please. Thank you. I, I did ask uh, Mark Green to gaze into his crystal ball um, just Wednesday of last week, but do you have any comments on that? Uh, yes. When this comes back to members next, we'll uh, include some uh, projections based on a, a, a more adverse scenario along the lines that you've, you've suggested. Councillor English, please. 
Fine. Thank you very much. Nobody else has indicated to speak. Um, therefore, um, this report was, was for consideration. So we move on to agenda item 20, which is the local plan review update, which is on pages 140 to 142 of your agenda packs. Um, and prior to the report's introduction, uh, Councillor Peter Cooling will address the committee for a period of up to three minutes. Peter, over to you, please. Thank you very much. Reg 19 requires significant modifications to accompany its submission. Some are substantial. Firstly, Michael Gove is reviewing the situation. <clears throat> the algorithm may be adjusted to move emphasis away from London and the South East. It may be brought up to date by mandating use of the latest ONS housing projections, which show an increase of some 165,000 households per annum over the planned period, and compares starkly with a 300,000 current annual target. While the government may wish to catch up with past undersupply, that gap may be too much to sustain. Embassy must therefore include a policy in Reg 19 to give flexibility to adjust to any changes in algorithm, even after it has been submitted. Surely NBC would not just plough ahead with a higher number. As an example, if the algorithm is redefined to use 2018 base, not 2014 base, ONS figures, it would reduce our requirements by some 2,500 over the review period. Secondly, when our local plan was adopted in October 2017, there was a huge rush to build. NBC celebrated dramatically exceeding the housing delivery test, but that was premature. As some developments have been pulled forward before planned trajectory slots, NBC is now in danger of failing the five years housing supply test if Reg 19 is not soon adopted. And the MPPF's unwelcome presumption in favor of sustainable development would then apply. Eventually, our new trajectory will have been approved by an inspector. We will be urging NBC to avoid another accelerated overbuild and subsequent threat to five years housing supply by incorporating policies to enable their reasonable management of build out to trajectory. Finally, Lee's Langley Relief Road consultants conclude that almost 4,000 homes will be needed to fund it if third party funding is not forthcoming. While some external funding may be forthcoming, Reg 19 has no allowance for homes to close any shortfall left by external funding. If the road does proceed with a contribution of homes required, NBC would then deliver in excess of the excess assessed housing needs. Reg 19 should include a contingency allowance for that road's implementation, removing the need for some identified sites. This Reg 19, if adopted, will itself be reviewed within five years, and the situation with respect to the road should then be clear. And, if unlikely to go ahead, that contingency will be replaced by newly defined sites. Or, if then going ahead, that contingency would mitigate any potential overbuild against the currently assessed housing needs. NBC should define new policies as Reg 19 modifications to allow for the above. You will be told, you have been told, this is all too difficult, premature and costly. However, please challenge officers now to be creative and define Reg 19 modifications to allow for the above to accompany submission. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Cooling. Um, Mark Edgerton will now introduce this report to members. Thank you, Chairman. So the consultation on the Local Plan Review Regulation 19 draft for submission documents is ongoing and due to finish on the 12th of December this year. Uh, this is the third public consultation on the local plan review proposals. The local planning authority has received approximately 670 representations to date, with a significant number of additional representations expected between now and the close of the consultation. As the report notes, processing of the representations is ongoing, and so is the first stage of the analysis. The majority of the representations have been associated with housing and related proposals, including the amount of housing proposed. Some have expressed the view that too much housing is being proposed from some of the local residents, for example. Others, including some from within the development industry, have taken the view that further sites should be included. Concerns have also been raised regarding the impacts of growth on the environment. However, the majority of comments at this stage have focused on developments in the main growth areas of Heathlands and Lidsing Garden communities. The representations have mainly raised concerns around the principles of these developments, their impacts on the sites and surrounding areas, and the provision of infrastructure, including transport infrastructure. 
And finally, just a reminder to members that this report tonight is for noting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor English, you have indicated to speak. Um, it's not that I disagree with you know, the aspirations of Councillor Coolin and Calc. In fact, I agree with them. But as we found out, I think Councillor Garton may, may be aware of this, from many, many government announcements on gypsy policy over the years, there's a big difference between a press statement or a speech, whichever party is in government, uh, than there is between an amendment to policy. And the problem is we don't know what amendments to policy will be. So we would be asking council officers to go away into a darkened corner and basically find a sacred goat and cut it open and read the entrails because that would be about as scientific a method as, as any other method to be, of predicting the future. Um, it's not that I, to be honest, given the way the government reaches its housing targets, there may actually be a better method, but uh, well, well, there you go. What's, what, my, what is clear is that the government dismissed the changes that the Office of National Statistics made in 2014 and all subsequent changes for the ONS have also been dismissed by the government and they have always gone for higher figures. There is going to be a major problem because demographic trends do not support the housing projections going forward. There will be, continue to be a short-term housing problem. There's not going to be a long one. Well, there will be, but it's not the one we're going to have. What we can't do, I think, is have lots of contingency plans in the local plan review for what might conceivably happen because that would be a very long document which probably wouldn't even get to examination because the inspectorate would uh, reject it. At this stage, I'm not saying I like this local plan, I think there's an awful lot wrong with it, um, but the process of an examination is to examine those issues for, and for people who object like myself, to a number of those proposals to put forward those objections and for the inspectorate to determine them. And that is where we are. Once we have the inspector's recommendations and we then have a schedule of modifications to work on, then we will actually, or the local plan is rejected or whatever, then we will know what we need to do. What we don't, what we can't possibly do is take a stab in the dark, think we know what's going to do, happen, um, and spend a lot of public money because that's what some other councils have done in the past and they've all tried to short circuit the process and they've all ended up spending a lot of money, wasting a lot of time and having to go back to do it all again. So I think what we have to do is encourage people who have got issues with this to put those to the examination for the inspectorate to determine it. Thank you very much, Councillor English. Councillor Clark and then Councillor Spring it, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I'd like to come back on a, a point that was made in the last um, strategic planning, which is the inclusion of Beacon Park um, in Coxheath. Um, I, I really feel that we have a, we have a, a site there that, that is a chink in the armour, if it, it, as it were, when it comes to the integrity of this plan. Um, we all have areas where we have concerns, we have areas where we think that may be a good site because it's a, a, a brownfield site, for instance. Um, but the one thing that I think every member would be concerned about is formulating a, a local plan, coming up with numbers, going through all of the grind to get that local plan to 18B, take it out to 18B, and then find that when it goes back, when that consultation feedback is considered, it then goes out to 19 with a completely new site that no one has even seen or had any feedback on as part of the original consultation or any of the consultation to that point. Um, and and I, do, I do wish, as a member of this committee, to find out what the why was that added? There must be, it was a public consultation, public feedback came back to this council. I think as members, we have a right to actually see what came forward in 18B to make that site go out into, into Regulation 19. Because I think it's something that can affect every member in this room. We, we, you know, there will be subsequent local plans. How would, how would members feel if all of a sudden we go out to consultation and, a, and a, a site is just dropped in, missing 
consultation from the earlier stages. In fact, if, if I was a developer that put something through the local plan from day one, I would be inclined to say, you, you know, even, even from a developer's perspective, this seems perverse and, and perhaps unfair. Um, but, but I would like to see that, I'd like to see that evidence, I'd like to be directed to it. If it's, if it's on the website and it's, it's um, part of a, a much bigger um, a public document, I, I really would like to understand how we came about that decision because it, it's something that I just think is, is a bit of a, a, a it's a bit of a curveball that we've received right at the end of this local plan, and I, and I don't think it's a, a good, a good um, I don't think it sort of adds, helps us when we're trying to say to residents, we can't remove these sites. There is speculation, but we, you know, we've got to hold our integrity. The government hasn't done this yet. We need to go forward with certain numbers that we've, we do know about. Um, when the mood music is that we, the numbers could go down, why, why are we doing this? And, and, and I, I hope that we can get that evidence as members from this committee. Thank, thank you very much, Councillor Clark. I'm not going to um, request that we go over old ground. You have had your time to discuss that at the previous um, SPY meetings where we have asked for, um, but where we have debated the local plan review. It was also debated at full council. Nevertheless, I will I allow Rob Jarman to come in very briefly on this, but I'm not going over old ground tonight. Yeah, as you said, Chairman, um, I don't think it's appropriate to go into detail. But as Councillor English pointed out, the, you know, the facts of the matter are on any consultation, um, we have to advise you based on information that we garner as the local plan evolves. Uh, as the chairman said, don't want to go into detail, but if we kept to exactly the same sites and exactly the same policies as in the first iteration of the local plan, well, it seems very strange that we've sort of retrofitted everything. I mean, to me, the whole point of consultation is, is actually to review matters and to carry out further analysis, and that's indeed what we did. And as Councillor English summed it up, at the end of the day, um, with this Regulation 19, I'm sure people will object to the existing sites, to the additional site that Councillor Clark mentioned, and at the end of the day, a government, an independent government inspector on objective analysis will decide yay or nay on all the policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Springett, please. Thank you. Mr. Cooling, I don't think there's a single councillor in this council that wouldn't like to put the numbers down. We'd love to put the numbers down. But at the moment, without the the chained government actually changing policy and putting that into print, we can't. We, we're just stuck with it. And it is so frustrating. I share your frustration. Um, we've all got sites we don't like. Um, I will be responding to the Reg 19. I haven't done it yet. I've had a busy week. But I will be responding and I will be speaking to the inspector. So I will be doing my bit, but at the moment the sites I don't like either are still in as well. So it's up to people to, to comment um, on the sites they're not happy with um, and to raise those objections with the inspector and that's where the final decision will rest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Russell, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, just really a point that I think it's quite interesting that we're talking about Beacons Park and yet at the full council meeting, you were quite prepared to put in a very different amendment for a very different site. Thank you very much. Um, I will come to you, Councillor English, but I, I wish to come to members who haven't spoken yet on this item. Councillor Garton, please. Yes, I, I would say I more or less entirely agree with what Councillor English said earlier on, except that I wouldn't use a goat, but tea leaves, it's a vegan option. But we are going through a consult, we are going through the consultation at the moment, and I think the message we've got to give to the public is we are listening to them. We are listening to uh, Councillor Cooling addressing the forum tonight. Um, we, we, we would like to lower the numbers, and if there's an opportunity in future, we will do so. But at the moment, things are as they are, 
and we have to crack on till we get instructed differently from an authority higher than us. Thank you very much. And Councillor English, please. Um, I'm not reopening a previous debate. I just want to formally ask that we have the, the information that was provided that supported the inclusion That's of Beacon Park. I mean, as a fair request, I'd like, just like to have it sent to me. I, we can, I think we can pick that up offline. That's absolutely fine. Um, and and I'm, that part of, of Councillor Clark's question I was more than happy with, but going over old rooms I, I think is, is, is most unhelpful. Um, members, this report is... Uh, uh, Sorry, Councillor Spooner, I apologise. Just, just very quickly, I'd just like to summarise things as uh, I see them. And, and yes, you know, Mr Coolen, we, we, we would love to reduce the figures, but we can't. And we have to progress through the straitjacket, that is how I would call it, that the government lays down to us. And to vary from that could well put us in serious, serious trouble. And the interesting thing about the local plan process is that it is evaluative, and it is incrementalist in it w in way it works. So we've had three public consultation periods. Um, some sites come in, sometimes so, sometimes sites come out. That is how the local plan process works. I am unhappy with some of the allocations. I'm sure most other borough councils are as well. But it's up to us all and to local residents to put their views to the inspector at the local plan hearing and see what comes out of it. And uh, that's all. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, I don't believe anyone else has indicated to speak. Um, this report was for noting. Um, therefore, is the report noted? Right, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity to adjourn for 15 minutes. Um, we've still got a, a, a few items to get through on the agenda and Russell is about to serve coffee outside for members. So if we can be back at five minutes to eight, I think that would be very useful. Um, Dennis. Mr. Chairman, can we ask the members of the public to join us? Oh, of course, I, okay, I see no you. reason why not. It's, uh,
Members, I'm about to restart the meeting, so if you could be seated, I'll give you 30 seconds. Thank you very much, members. Um, I hope you appreciated that. Um, we're now on to item number 21 on our agenda, which is the uh, Mason Authority Monitoring Report, which is um, from pages 143 to 248 of your agenda packs. Um, and this report is going to be introduced virtually by Anna Ironmonger. Anna, over to you, please. Hi, thanks, Chair, and good evening, members. Um, the Authority Monitor Report is an annual report covering the period of the 1st of April 2020 to the 31st of March 2021. The purpose of the AMR is to detail the implementation of policies within the adopted Maidstone Borough Local Plan to also set out any engagement under the duty to cooperate during the monitoring year and to outline progress on the local plan review. Just going to highlight some key points that are within the AMR in terms of the indicators but also the LDS. Um, so the LDS Maidstone um, from 2021 to 2023 was adopted in July 2021 and the delivery so far on the local plan review is on track. Uh, the AMR provides a summary of any engagement as part of the duty to cooperate which has taken place during the monitoring year. In terms of the local plan monitoring indicators, since 2011, a total of 9,095 dwellings have been completed. Previous years have, been, have seen a shortfall in delivery of housing. However, strong delivery in the year 2020-21 met this shortfall. The significant effect indicators show that 1,354 dwellings were completed during the monitoring year. A total of 48 schemes on the infrastructure delivery plan have been delivered since the first iteration of the IDP back in 2016. In this, monitor, in this reporting year, sorry, the total amount of money from planning obligations received towards infrastructure was in excess of £5 million. In the urgent update, paragraph 2.39 of the committee report has been amended, uh, which says that whilst the majority of other sustainable transport measure, measures to support the growth identified in the local plan remain broadly on track to be delivered within the time periods identified within the infrastructure delivery plan, the MITP schemes are now at risk of being delivered beyond the time frames identified in the IDP. Now looking at the significant effect indicators, these show that secondary schools in 2017 were operating at 90% level, which was an increase to 98% in 2021. The capacity for primary schools has also changed by 1%. In 2018-19, 15.9% of adults in the borough walk as their main mode of travel at least three times per week, with a further 2.4% of adults who cycle three times per week. And then finally, there was a decrease in the number of visits to Maidstone Borough, which contrasts with the county as a whole. This evening, me members are asked to note the Maidstone Authority Monitoring Report. Thank you and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Anna. I think the report was quite self explanatory. Does uh, anyone have anything? Uh, Councillor Garden. Yes, Mr. Chairman. This is a statutory requirement, this report. Um, it requires us to spend a lot of money on this report, taxpayers' money. We have no choice about it, but it is an excellent report and it is a very useful tool. And uh, may we put it forward that it, it will be prominently displayed on the website for all citizens of Maidstone to have access to this absolutely excellent document. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very happy with that and I, I will ask uh, that officers um, and the, the um, communications team put that forward. Um, oh, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I did a, a couple of points I wanted to raise. First of all, uh, to do with the education. Um, 
the one percent change in capacity at primary schools that that strikes me as being quite concerning um, given the Given that we were operating in 2017 at a 90% level and we're now at 98%, um, I'm trying to work out why that would be the case. Could this be down to conversions where sort of, sort of funds for school, schools have not been collected on uh, permitted development rights up to the point at which we had um, the Article 4? Um, I'm just curious to know how concerning that is for officers and what the background is to it. Um, but also, with 2.39, um, I, I mean, I, I'm, really, I'm really quite sort of, um, I don't really know what to say. A total of 16% of the actions with the integrated transport strategy have not been actioned. I mean, that really that comes down to how you, how you sort of present this, because I think most residents would think that um, that almost implies that, that we're sort of... Um, we're 84 percent of the way there. Action, if something is actioned, isn't necessarily something that's delivered. And I think that residents would feel that the transport schemes really are, um, they are so far behind housing. Um, in terms of uh, our, our own sort of, our own forum for discussing transport, we, we haven't had a, a joint transport meeting for so long now. And, and quite often we see it cancelled where there's, there's um, insufficient business and it's very concerning to me I mean just to give just to give one site or one of the major deliveries within um, the 2017 local plan southeast of Maidstone Langley Park um, of all that housing the one scheme that was requested by KCC um, as part of the harm that that housing would would uh, cause on the road network we, have, we don't even have a plan for it. I find that very disappointing. And I, and I do feel that when we're talking about um, just 16% uh, of 16 of, uh, of the actions not being actioned, I'm, I'm not sure if that really does give a, a fair reflection of what's going on with transport. Thank you very much, Councillor Clark. Very good points. Um, Rob Jarman, please. Yeah, uh, as you said, Chairman, yeah, it's, it's a good point that Councillor Clark has raised with regard to um, the delivery of um, uh, road improvement schemes, and that's hopefully comprehensively covered in your urgent update report. Thank you very much. Um, nobody else has indicated to speak, therefore, uh, this report is for noting. Uh, members, is that noted? Thank you very much, and, and thank you very much, Anna, for introducing this report. Um, we move on, therefore, to item 22, which is the Infrastructure Funding Statement 2020-2021. Uh, this report will be introduced by Rob Jarman. Over to you, please. Uh, thanks, Chairman. Um, this is, again, like the annual monitoring report, a statutory uh, requirement, and it has to be produced every calendar year before the 31st of December. So, as the uh, title suggests, it's a financial statement with regard to last business year. So, it ended on the 31st of March, uh, 2021. So, in straightforward English, it's the money collected um, through Section 106 legal agreements and the community infrastructure levy, increasingly so, um, in terms of the proportion. And it's money going out as well. Um, obviously, we're not a unitary authority. So for the vast um, majority of cases, the money that goes out is a, is a transfer of money, uh, for instance, to Kent County Council Education, to Kent County Council uh, Highways. Um, there is a proportion that obviously goes into Maidstone Borough Council services, uh, notably um, parks and open space. And increasingly, we are collecting um, what I call commuted sums, whereby affordable housing for viability reasons can't be provided on site, so they are used off site, and um, there's been 
successful redevelopments of Union Street car park um, and Bruns Brunswick Street uh, car parks um, using um, committed sum sums for the delivery of, fo of affordable housing. And I'd also, to finish off, I'd like to emphasise that if one looks at the amounts of monies being held by Maidstone Borough Council in Section 106, Section 106 legal agreements, it, it is a substantial amount. It's, it's over £10 million. However, as we all know, and I think there was a discussion earlier tonight, um, Section 106 payments don't pay for schemes in isolation. They're, they're an aggregation. So obviously it takes time to build up a pool of money. And as councillors will know, particularly for, say, um, uh, capacity uh, improvements to junctions, it, it takes a long time. KCC highways uh, obviously cover all of Kent, but they have to undertake um, pretty resource-intensive um, surveys to find out exactly where services beneath ground are. Um, there, there's usually long consultation exercises, and it usually um, means going through a few uh, stages of authorization as well. So it, it, it takes time to draw down these monies. And for you know, very good audit reasons, we will not depart with the monies we've collected until we've got schemes to align the, the monies to. Obviously, from, in terms of SIL, um, we haven't come to councillors yet in terms of the strategic SIL, but we will be doing so in, in the new year, and um, at the end of the day, you will be deciding where the SIL monies go to in terms of projects. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Russell has indicated to speak. Thank you, Chair. Um, I opened my copy of the Borough Insight, and on page four I saw that the Greensands GP Centre um, was getting 482,000 from 11 Section 106 healthcare contributions that had been combined. Now that's great, um, and obviously that would be a brilliant new facility. I just, I find it really hard, and it might just be because I'm new, to track how that works through some of these reports. So I've, you know, I've seen this report, I saw the previous year's one, I just would really appreciate an opportunity to sit down with officers and just have a real detailed discussion on Section 106 in particular, because I know SID is different. Um, that was my first point. And then my second request is that I'd really like a report on the Section 106 monies that have a spend-by date of 2022 and what they are planning to spend them on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, would it be possible at some point for us to have a report for the, the spend by, um, you know, because it strikes me that, as Councillor Ross has, has indicated, that there is a degree of urgency if this money is going to run out in 2022. Um, yeah. Yes, I mean, yeah. it's an overlapping point, really. Um, we do have, um, obviously, a database. It's called the Exacom system, and if um, the Councillor would is happy to come into Maidstone House, we can show the database and we can key into the particular projects the councillor is concerned about and um, you can see which section 106 is are running out in 2022 presumably for Marden and Yalding. Thank you very oh, much. Councillor I was going Ross. to say oral, oh. sorry. Oh. No, 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 please, please come in Carol. Alternatively, yeah, we, we can um, get you that report. I can print that off from Exicom and get you spend by dates um, and email to you if that's any easier. Uh, are you happy with that, uh, Councillor Russell? Um, I think I did get that report um, from uh, Carol before, but I, I just I would really like just to sit down with you because obviously you know, you know a lot more and just go through it if that would be all right. Thank you. Happy to do that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. I think that's, that's very helpful. Um, Councillor Springett. Thank you. Um, I did notice this when I was reading the report. I've just noticed it now. Page 265, strategic SIL expenditure. Um, we'll invite, it says the council will invite SIL strategic funding bids in 2022 from a range of infrastructure delivery organisations. Um, the top one, because it says this includes, but is not limited to, 
traffic signalisation of the M20 Junction 7 roundabout. I'm very sorry, I think that's down to national highways. I'm really sorry, I don't think we should pay for that. We have a lot more important road bits that need doing than funding national highways <laughs> junction improvements. Just, just a bit surprised that one's on there. Thank you, uh, Rob Sharman. Yes, um, to go back in time, um, national highways, when they were called Highways England, objected from memory to three sites uh, to the southeast of Maidstone. Um, I think from memory, one of them was the um, Church Road site. But to cut a long story short, um, three section 106s were signed whereby the house builders um, contributed or are contributing to the part signalization of Junction 7 itself. And that's been in the infrastructure delivery plan for since it conception. Um. I, I get that. But the people that suffer from the increased traffic from those developments are the likes of the people in Willington Street, in Bearstead Village, who would really quite like some, we'd like some chicanes in Bearstead, please, and some, some reasons to stop people using us as a shortcut, which they do. They use us as a shortcut to avoid going down Willington Street and hitting the queue at the A20. So I think money really should be spent more locally in our ways England or national highways can flip in pay for their own traffic lights. William. Um, yes, just on, on that point as well, it's worth adding that um, over the last couple of years we've made various attempts to access government grant funding pots to plug the, the gap for the motorway junction scheme and we'll, we'll keep going with those opportunities as they arise and hopefully that will be a source of funding that we need. So, And ultimately, as Rob Jarman says, the decisions as to how silly is allocated will be made in this committee anyway. Okay, I get that. There is a funding that's been received to widen the 249 between the two roundabouts by the crematorium. But that is going to be even worse for Bearstead because the traffic queue that was there just moves to the other end of Newcut Road. So even more vehicles will come through my village than the 8,000 a day that come through there. And so it's just really rather galling to hear that that we, we, we'll deal with the highways or national highways problem on the motorway, but it's okay because they can just put up with it down there. So I'd just like to put a request out, please, for some funding for some chicanes or something in Bearsley Village to reduce the amount of traffic that comes through because all these other schemes, they solve the problem up road, but they don't solve the problem down further down. They just make it worse. Thank you. Sorry, it's local frustration. Thank you very much, uh, Rob. Yeah, so, sorry, Chairman, to extend this, but um, uh, I think, good, good point, Councillor Springer. The, the place to, to sort of make those bids, if you like, is in the infrastructure delivery plan. Because although, although you know, clearly it's, it's, a, it's up to you at the end of the day where SIL money is spent, but it should be broadly in accordance with the infrastructure delivery plan, which in turn is based on the adopted local plan. And it goes back to the junction improvements Councillor Clark mentioned um, earlier tonight. Thank you very much. Councillor Garson, please. Yeah, Mr Chairman, very quickly, I mean, uh, I'm only willing to rant here, but rant rather publicly because I go to village halls and uh, public meetings up and down my ward and people tell me we need infrastructure before development and we've got all this money in the kitty. We are not the delivering authority, we are the, only the 
uh, money collecting authority. We are not having infrastructure before development. We don't even have it contemporaneously with development. We will have it, if we are lucky, some years after development. And as I said, we are not the delivering authority. We, we, there are other groups like um, the Highways Authority, the Clinical Commissioning Group, etc., etc. Is there any way that MBC can um, compel infrastructure providers to spend this money quickly? I think certainly with regards to the Highways Authority, we've been doing an awful lot of compelling lately. Um, I, 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 William, have you got anything to add to that? Well, uh, I, th I think you've got the control, haven't you, through the SIL um, regime. You know, we've got the first opportunity, the first prospectus that you'll be looking at early in the new year and then deciding on the bids that, that come in. So I think, you know, you can look at the, the track record of infrastructure providers and also look to the role that Maidstone itself can play as an infrastructure provider. Um, on page 261, it shows that we've made um, good grounds in terms of green spaces and affordable housing. So, you know, SEAL does give you that opportunity to take control. Councillor Lynch, did you wish to come back on that? Uh, Councillor Garton, sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I hope that things, what I read in between the lines, things are supposed to get a little bit better. Let's hope it will. Thank you very much. Um, and finally, on this item, I have Councillor English, please. In terms of the one area which we very much are a delivery authority, and in terms of uh, open space, can I ask quite how that list was drawn up? Because there's... Um, an awful lot of um, <coughs> parks and recreation areas, nature reserves that don't appear on it, some of which, some of which I admit have got uh, Section 106 contributions possibly coming their way, which may be why. But, um, th but it seems a very odd list because there's several large parks that don't appear in Maidstone, several nature reserves that, that appear and others that don't. So how was that drawn up? Um, Mrs. Williams can, can come in with more detail, but as I said before, th this is purely a statement um, on last financial year, so perhaps there weren't any Section 106 schemes that were directly linked to those um, parks. Yes, that, that's, that's what I was going to um, add. So... All of this is historic, so in terms of the, on page 264, when it says uh, infrastructure provision should al allow um, sub details of planned expenditure, section 106 expenditure, on page 264 across each main spend area. Um, I, th I think I need to have to pursue this with, with Carol and Rob because I, 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 in, in terms of that sentence, I'm not seeing some things there that I thought I should be seeing. Fine. Uh, so I, I'll have to take this offline okay. and have no. a more detailed conversation. Uh, Councillor English, thank you very much, and, and I'm sure um, uh, officers will be more than happy to take that offline with you. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody else has indicated to speak on this item, and uh, the report is for noting. Um, I assume that report is noted, members. Thank you very much. Right, uh, we now have two items left, um, so uh, it is starting to get late. So, I, I, if we um, uh, obviously, I encourage everyone to comment, um, but if we can try and make our, our comments fairly concise and, and to avoid repeating ourselves, um, that would be uh, very much appreciated for the. Um, ease of debate. So we move on to art, uh, item 23, which is the Article 4 direction covering the primary shopping area of Maidstone and the renewal of certain existing Article 4 directions, which is pages 269 to 289 of your agenda pack. This is going to be introduced by Rob Jarman. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman. So the government um, fairly recently amalgamated uh, different use classes um, all the different types of uh, retail, um, the different uh, business classes, uh, leisure uses and some other um, 
uses and amalgamated them all together in something called use class E. And then later, it introduced a, a new permitted development right, class MA. So all of those uses can be um, the subject of permitted development. So a building, without the need for planning permission, can be converted from its existing use, say retail, into residential. So for two main reasons, um, potentially if, if the market is able to just continue, um, there's, there's a strong possibility that the town centre will become dominated by residential. I think secondly as well, and we've had this conversation um, many times um, at this committee, um, I think most people would say some of the, the actual quality of some of these conversions under permitted development leaves something to be desired. In fairness, with the new um, permitted development right, um, there are more conditions. Um, there's a condition about daylighting. I think I've mentioned previously, there's a condition regarding um, transport and access. There's a condition about noise. But as I've said before, these are, you know, these cover all of England, so by their very nature, these conditions are general. So the first Article 4 direction that I'm recommending is that um, to, to prevent the use of permitted development rights um, going from Class E to residential is in the primary shopping centre of Maidstone. As has been explained previously, um, one needs a strong evidence base for um, an Article 4 direction, and the government has recently said it needs to be um, in a tightly defined geographical area. And one of the examples the government actually gives is what they call the core shopping area. So we define the primary shopping area of Maidstone in the adopted local plan. So obviously we passed examination and there was an evidence base behind that and that, as, as we all know, passed examination. There's been a review of that with the local plan uh, review and exactly the same area has been kept. So I feel we've got a strong evidence base to support an Article 4 direction uh, in the sh primary shopping area to prevent um, permitted development for changes of use from Class E into residential. So that would mean that basically we, we have control. Um, uh, landowners would have to submit planning applications. And then secondly, as councillors will know, um, just over two years ago, we um, served Article 4 directions on 14 of the best um, office buildings in, in Maidstone. Now, the earlier Article 4 I'm recommending in the primary shopping area covers um, some of those. The residual are six. And again, my second recommendation is that a non-immediate Article 4, uh, which uh, eliminates compensation, is, is served on those six um, office buildings which are outside the primary shopping area and of an appropriate size as well. And that's it, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, just before I invite members to speak, can I just remind everyone um, that we are still in open session, so please do not um, make any comments which could be commercially sensitive um, or, or cause any consternation. Um, I'm sure you, you get my drift there. Um, I, Councillor Clark, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think actually it's worth going back to that 
paragraph in, on page 151 at the base there where it said secondary schools in 2017 were operating at a 90% level which has increased to 98% in 2021. Um, there, there is pressure on the borough from these conversions because essentially the article 4 doesn't stop, it doesn't give a judgment on conversions, it just says they have to go through the planning process. So people that want to do a conversion can still do so, but it means that there are certain checks and balances which we can we can ensure. Um, and one major thing is that we can make sure that for all of the residents that may move into those new units, there will be funding collected for the schools, the infrastructure, um, everything from libraries through to um, the roads. Um, so I, I think it's not it's not unfair, or it's not unreasonable to expect. Um, a big demand for conversions actually because there's a lot of empty spaces in the town at the moment um, we're in a we're exposed because right now they may be empty but if they get converted very quickly before we come out of the covid um, pandemic um, we we haven't really had a chance to do anything with them during a recovery we've just literally had them there available with under permitted development to be to be cashed in on for for housing um, so I think it's not unreasonable to, to have a, an Article 4. I think some of these sort of uh, statistics like school places that sort of conspire against residents could be, um, there can be a mitigation of that, that harm. Um, so I, I would like to raise, I would like to um, propose the papers. I think it's a, a, it's a reasonable idea. We've already gone through the political process to protect these office spaces. Um, We've got a level of exposure because there's certain offices that are going to come back onto permitted development, and this just brings them back again because we've already got the evidence from before that they are valuable to our borough. And um, if we've got the if we've got the evidence base for this, I think we should just move forward with that. Thank you very much. Um, that's proposed, and I uh, you indicated to second Councillor English. Thank you very much. Um, I've got Councillor Garton and then Councillor Munther, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Article 4 directions, I, I always feel rather um, reluctant to use this power. Uh, it's a permitted development right, which is a property right. It is a right which a property owner has to develop his property without unnecessary hindrance. However, we are talking here about Maidstone Town Centre, and like all town centres all over the country, uh, the town centres are changing, changing rather rapidly, and we need to have a sort of, for once in Maidstone, a strategy. And we are now setting out to develop a town centre strategy. And while in the past I uh, went on record and co uh, called Maidstone Town Centre architectural vomit, I think we should have... Um, this time, grab the opportunity and uh, put something good out to Maidstone. And so therefore, I, uh, although I am rather reluctant to use this power, I, I'd be willing tonight to, to uh, vote for this proposal. However, we should invite all affected property owners to actively participate at the town centre strategy and also open uh, public workshops for those uh, property owners to participate. Thank you very much, Councillor Garson. Uh, yet another quote that we can attribute to you. One day we might want to publish a book of them. Uh, next to speak, um, I have uh, Councillor Mumford, please. <coughs> yeah, I'd like the, uh, the proposer and seconder to consider adding this to what we're proposing. Um, my favourite document, local plans, local plan reviews, I read them a lot. Um, and what we have done, we've uh, gone for dispersal and we've allocated homes that have already been built to larger villages. We're going to start looking at smaller villages, rural service centre, etc. Now, the homes are there, and with these new permitted development rights, 
we're losing the services that uh, allowed those homes to be built. So what I'm asking, I can give you an example. We put in, we, Maidstone Borough Council, allocated 150 houses with three retail outlets in that community, two of which have already been lost. And so we're going to end up with unsustainable locations that we picked for their sustainability. So I think we can uh, satisfy the potential harm that, um, uh, that uh, it's trying to prevent. So I'm asking that we consider reviewing the hierarchy of development, that would be the larger villages, etc., starting of the smaller ones, and finding the key services and considering Article 4 for those key ser services uh, within those, what we decided were sustainable locations. If you read the local plan, it does say we will resist the loss of services. Um, how can we resist it if we don't even get a say in it? Thank you very much, Councillor. Yeah, of course. Uh, I, I just come back as proposal um, very briefly because I'm, um, uh, Councillor English is about to come in. Um, my only concern is that we, if we've got a strong evidence base and we've got a very tight um, approach to the town centre, I'm, I'm concerned that we may put ourselves at risk if we widen this. And I do wonder if we could perhaps cover that in a separate initiative, whether that come back to this committee, but that's just my fir first thoughts. My, my understanding would be that this would need to be a totally separate exercise, but, um, you, you know, and, and perhaps could we therefore change, uh, would you be happy in accepting Councillor Mumford? Uh, yeah, however, I, I will allow you to speak as a second, but I, I was just going to, I'm speaking to, to Councillor Clark as a proposal. Would you be happy to change your proposal to take into account Councillor Mumford's view? Um, I, I'm willing to propose that, or we could add to the proposal that additionally a review yeah, is... Yeah, I, I, I don't see why we can't add it that additionally we investigate that as part of the proposal. I think that might be the easiest. No, I, I, it, it, it's kind of almost as if uh, Councillor Clark is making two proposals, that, if that makes sense, because otherwise we have to vote on one and then it, it for speak. Fine. Uh, Councillor English, I, uh, sorry, thank you for waiting patiently. Uh, Councillor Mumford, your microphone is on. Strictly speaking, it should be two motions, but there's no problem in, ta in having a motion in two parts as long as those two parts are clearly set out. Um, because clearly the, the issues that Councillor Mumford outlined are important issues, but there would be some evidence, a significant amount of evidence to collect. And, and with Article 4, so the best thing to do is to press on as reasonably quickly as you can without short-circuiting the system, as Councillor Garton correctly pointed out. Um, so we would, it would not be wise to, to delay the first part of this work and wait for the second part. But I'm quite happy for, for the second part to take place. Uh, and I think it, it does identify some clear issues that we need to address. Um, so, in that sense, as long as we're clear that they are, t you know, two, two pieces of work, then I'm quite happy to proceed on that basis. And I think um, that everyone in this room is, is roughly on the same page with this. So, um, let's crack on with it. Um, were you indicating, Councillor Garton, that you wouldn't be happy with that approach? No, I'm not. I mean, while I was rather enthusiastic for the motion on paper dealing with the town centre tonight for very specific reasons, um, I, I think if we are diverting or opening up the debate uh, for, sec uh, for Article 4 uh, uh, rules, then um, uh, uh, directions, I cannot really support that. Uh, because, uh, as I said, I am generally rather reluctant to uh, go for Article 4. So if we take it as two motions, I think I could vote for the papers in front of us. Thank you very much, 
Councillor Carson, uh, it was resolved at the last meeting that the Head of Planning and Development be requested to produce a list of proposed sites where it might be appropriate to implement Article 4 directions to be presented to the Committee at a later date. Um, now, I'm going to move to the, the vote for simplicity. There is a proposal on the table which is essentially in two parts. I will take it as one vote because it is one proposal. Um, all of those members in favour? Um, and those against? Those abstaining? Councillor Garden. Thank you very much. Um, the motion is carried. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, members. Um, right, uh, please, uh, Councillor Coolen, I'm very sorry to exclude you at this point. <laughs> no, all the very best, I'm sure we will uh, see, I will see you very soon. Um, so, uh, members, um, I move that the public be excluded for the items set out in part two of the agenda, which is um, only item 24, because of the likely uh, disclosure of exempt information for the reasons specified having applied the public interest test. Um, the committee will not enter open session after this. Um, thank you very much. It was previously agreed at the beginning of the meeting, but are we still in agreement, members? It was agreed at the beginning of the meeting, but is it still agreed? We can enter a uh, close session. Thank you very much. Um, chop, chop. <laughs>